For those who don't know, my name is Ricky Ragone. I'm the music and arts pastor here at the church. Occasionally I get to preach, and today is one of those days, so lucky you. <laughs> but uh, we are continuing in our series, The Gospel According to Luke, Mission to the World, and a point that Pastor Lou brings out regularly and I think is important, that it is the gospel according to Luke, because there's only one gospel. His name's Jesus, and the accounts we have are just different accounts of all that Jesus has done. So it's not Luke's gospel, it is the gospel according to him. And we are in, as you know from your scripture reading, verse, verses 31 and 38 of chapter 22. So you can go ahead and get there if you're not still there from scripture reading. Ooh, this is a nice cold bottle. Sorry. You needed to know that. Write that down. Talk about it in your community groups. Um, <laughs> condensation. But a couple weeks ago, we began our time in the, uh, what's known as the upper room. Uh, a couple weeks ago here, Jesus sent out his disciples into the city, the city of Jerusalem, which we know at the time of Passover would have been ex- extremely crowded. And he sent them out to go and find a man carrying a jar of water. You can imagine that would be like finding a needle in a haystack. But he tells them to find this man, to follow him to the house that he enters. Tell the master of the house that the teacher says to you, where, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and will prepare the Passover meal there. And that is where we have been over the past few weeks as Jesus spends meaningful time with his disciples. This is their last meal together before Jesus' betrayal, his arrest, and his crucifixion. So he has a lot to share with them as they sit around this table. Again, not one long table that they're all sitting on one side of looking real weird like in the painting we see, but in a table on the ground leaning on it Uh, close quarters together. And we saw Jesus institute what we know as the Lord's Supper, communion in this time, as he broke bread with them and they took the cup and he was pointing them to the work that was to come as he would give his life, will give his life on the cross. And we're going to be continuing that together this morning following our time in the Word. During that meal, he also tells his disciples, there's a betrayer among you. And then they start to question one another, wondering who did it? Who, who's the one who it's going to be? And not only do they question about that, they then begin to argue amongst themselves. And we saw this last week, who's the greatest? What a weird argument to get into. But Jesus points them to true greatness, serving selflessly, as Jesus himself demonstrates. And he demonstrates more perfect than anyone ever could. For he is the Son of Man who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And then he tells them the hope that is to come. They've stuck with him through trials. They've been with him. And there's a future hope of dining with him, not in an upper room on a floor, but around the table in his eternal kingdom. And the apostles will be seated on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. What an amazing thing for them to sit and and hear and to think about. But however, after he tells them that, that's where our passage picks up. And Jesus has some difficult news to lay in front of them that we'll look at this morning. And hopefully as we we look at these verses, we're going to see that despite our sin, despite our failure, Jesus in his grace intercedes for us, that he could still use us, That he will prepare us for mission and ultimately Jesus is the one who provides us with atonement for sin. And that will bring us in our conclusion to the communion table. So maybe that's not a succinct way to summarize it, but that's that's the thrust. Um, So here's the outline that we're going to look at. See, praying for Peter, predicting Peter's denial, Jesus preparing the disciples and providing atonement as we hone in on verse 37. But let's start here in verses 31 and 32. 
Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Again, this is, if the upper room was Jesus' final meal, this is Jesus' final words within the final meal of the upper room. Coming off of telling them they're going to sit with him at the table of, in the kingdom. But he has more to tell them. And he gets their attention by this repeat. He says, Simon, Simon. So that would have really perked up Peter's attention. That's who Simon is. Simon is Peter. But then repeating it twice. When we see Jesus say words twice, that means you better listen. And not only would Peter have been paying attention. Again, it's, it's not like they're in a, a room this size. Everyone would have perked up. Like, why did he just say that twice? Why did he use the name Simon? That, that name that we see as, you know, known as Peter's pre-Christian name before he followed Christ. All these were, were to emphasize, I'm about to say something to you that's vitally important. You need to hear it. Listen up. But he wants Peter to really hear it. That's whose name he addresses. And he tells them there's something happening that they, they, don't, they can't see, that they can't perceive. See, they know that there are religious leaders who are against Jesus and against them, and they've been causing trouble. But what they don't know is that the battle that's happening spiritually. So Jesus tells them that Satan demanded to have them. He had to make a demand. Satan doesn't have free reign. He demanded to have you. Now, I'll bring some clarity here because it's a little confusing, especially in English. He starts with Simon, Simon. But then he says, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. In the Greek, the word you, he's saying, is he's kind of addressing the whole group. It's a plural word. Like if I was talking to you as all the people sitting here. So that's plural. So Satan's demanding not just to have Peter to sift him like wheat. He wants the disciples he demanded to have you. And again, he has to make the demand. He can't just pick and choose what he's going to do. We talked about this recently. We don't want to make too much of Satan, but we don't want to make too little because we know he's not omniscient. We know he's not all-powerful, but he is at work. He's at work, but he's not in control. And that's important to remember. He's very much at work, but he's not in control. Like everything else that has been created, he is under God's sovereign hand. He has to make demands to get what he wants. He doesn't will it into being. So Jesus tells him, Satan demanded to have you. He wants all of you. He wanted to sift you like wheat. The sifting process, this whole, the whole thing in dealing with wheat, was a fairly violent process. They kind of beat the snot out of it. To, that's the threshing process. Literally, I've watched a video of people doing it. They're, just, they're whacking wheat. So they, get, they beat it, and then they put it in these sifters, and they're shaking it violently to get all this useless chaff, this powder, to just blow away so that all that's left is wheat. And Satan wants to sift them. He wants to shake them violently. That they wouldn't remain as wheat, but that they would blow away like chaff. Because these men, they're essential to God's plan for building the church. And Satan could see that to some degree. He saw, he knows that you take out those closest to Christ, things are going to crumble. So he demanded to have them. But Satan doesn't get the final word. He's not in control. And Jesus lets his disciples know that. Because he continues, he says, But I have prayed for you that your faith not, may not fail. Here's where it does get confusing once again. Verse 31, both yous were plural. Verse 32, now it's a you singular. He's back to addressing Peter. So... Satan wants all of you, and then he's focusing back in on Peter. But I prayed for you, Peter, 
that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. These men all were essential to the mission of God and his plans and purposes. But Peter, among them, stands out kind of as a leader of the group. Use the language of the church like a first among equals. All essential, but but, but Peter is that vocal one. The, The one that particularly, if Satan gets to, could be bad for the group. So Jesus is interceding for Peter. He's standing and pleading in his place against Satan's work. And he's praying for him, praying for him earnestly that his faith would not fail. And as Jesus prays for Peter, I think what's really important for us to see is the, the content of Jesus' prayer. I know it's very short what he says. He says, your faith may not fail. What he doesn't say is, Peter, I prayed for you that you wouldn't have to go through any trials. That all the hardship wouldn't be there for you. He doesn't pray that Satan wouldn't try to sift him or touch him or the disciples. But he's praying that in the midst of all that is to come, and there's a lot that's going to come, that in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the shaking, that Peter's faith would not fail. And so often we we want to be removed from the trial. Right? Like what crazy person wouldn't want to be removed from a trial? Like no one's like, I just... Life's boring. Shake it up. Just ruin my life for a little bit. Amen. Like, that's not the prayer we pray. We don't want the trial. But what's more important is that in the midst of him, faith would remain. It's our faith in Christ by which we're saved. To to be saved from a trial but to lose faith would be just as damning. More so eternally, right? But it's through trials, it's through being shaken and sifted that we can often, if our faith does not fail, it can actually be strengthened. And our greatest hardships and even our failures can show us just more greatly how much we need Christ, how much we need His grace, how much we need His mercy, His direction. That's what Peter's going to see. Now, Jesus knew what Peter needed to go through to become who Jesus knew he would be. And that's why after Jesus tells Peter, I'm praying that your faith wouldn't fail, he even says, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Not if, when. He knows the outcome of the trial. After you've been shaken by trials, after you've been deeply broken, yet still with your faith intact, you will turn again. It's kind of repentance language. Go from one direction to another. Turn about face and walk the other way. When you've turned again, use the lessons that that you've learned to strengthen your brothers. Why? So their faith would be strengthened. That their faith wouldn't fail. We can learn so much from people's stories of trials and hardship, failures, sin. Because when they come out on the other side, they're testimonies of God's grace, God's provision. We hear how God can bring someone through impossible situations in life. Our faith in him can also be strengthened. We have a, it was mentioned earlier, a baptism class this morning. When people get baptized, we don't just dunk them in water and and that's it. No, there's a time of testimony being shared. As we hear not only how they came to faith, but but how, how God used all kinds of circumstances to bring them to the place that they're in. And we see God can work through any situation. And, and that can, can give us a strengthening in our faith. Like, if God can do that, I just need to trust that God. I need to see all that he can do. And it's encouraging to the body. Seeing all that Christ has done. But this strengthening, it's not in our own might. But it's because we have the perfect Son of God interceding for us. 
We have the Spirit at work in us. So though in this particular passage, Jesus is is addressing Peter and he's saying, Peter, I've been praying for you that your faith may not fail. We know from the scriptures that Jesus intercedes for all of his people. Romans 8.34 says, Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. It's a tremendous hope. Yes, we're responsible for our actions. We know that though we are responsible for our actions, we know that our faith will be sustained by the power of Christ through his interceding work in the power of the Spirit. But prayer isn't just for Jesus to be praying for us before the Father. We also need to be praying for one another. One of the things I love about Church Center or any of the iterations of church tech we've had throughout the years is our ability to, when we're apart, still connect and share our needs and share what's going on in our lives so people can be praying for each other. One of the, one of the distinctives of living in community is praying for each other. It should be a regular habit of every community group whether in that time of in-person meeting or those times apart. We need to be lifting up one another in prayer. If you were at our installation service for the deacons and the pastor elders, you saw there was a lot of prayer, asking for God's protection, asking that he would empower those who he's raised up, that he would watch after them, his hand would be on them. Why? Ultimately, so their faith wouldn't fail. They, They would be able to serve the body well, and continue to press on. We pray for each other, knowing that the one who bought us with his blood is interceding for us. Now, as Jesus is telling Peter this, what's happening here in verse 31 and 32, he hasn't actually told him that he's going to deny him yet. Like, Peter doesn't know that. So it's no mystery That after Jesus tells him he's praying for him that his faith wouldn't fail and he's going to turn again, Peter's response is not a surprising one. So let's look at what Peter says to Jesus. Right, Verse 33, typical Peter fashion. He's gung-ho. He's all in. He said, Peter Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. It's not a bad response from Peter. I think we would all want to respond that way. I'm I'm all in. I'm I'm going to, I'll go to the the worst places, a prison. I'll even die for you. But his response is kind of ignoring the point of what Jesus is, is saying. He's not grasping the power play here as Satan is demanding them. And Jesus is praying for him. He's not seeing how important that that fact is. He's looking at how he feels in the moment. He's pretty fired up. He's ready to run through a brick wall for Jesus. Like, you tell me to do it, I'll go. It doesn't matter. He's looking inward. He's, he's really looking at his, his own strength, his own emotion, and saying, that may be the case, but I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus, I will do anything for you. Like trying to convince Jesus as though Jesus doesn't know better. It's typical Peter. It's a great character aspect and also a character flaw. We all have them. And I just picture Jesus as Peter is saying this to him, that he's almost like shaking his head like, oh, Peter. Ah, man, I appreciate that. But unfortunately, I got some bad news. Right? Because Peter says it, and then Jesus is like, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day. Until you deny me, not once, but three times that you know me. That you deny three times that you know me. And I can only imagine in that moment that Peter's heart sinks into his stomach as he hears that. Because by now, I think Peter does know Jesus isn't, he hasn't really been wrong this entire time. He's told people their sin and he knows it. He's He's not mistaken. This is probably 
going to happen. And when things heat up, when uh, arrest and danger are in play, as we're going to see in not long from now in this chapter, when Peter feels outnumbered and overwhelmed by all of those who are against Jesus, his feelings that he has here in the upper room change drastically. And it's not like it's days away, it's not weeks away, it's not months away. It's literally hours away. Before morning dawns, he's going to deny knowing Jesus three times. If I'm, in Peter, if I'm Peter, I don't even know how to reconcile that in my head. Because he knows how he feels. I'll, I'll do anything for you. I'm dedicated in every way. But yet, I'm going to deny knowing you three times? Really? And what's truly hope-giving in this passage is that Jesus knows Peter's going to deny him three times. Yet he's already told Peter, you're going to turn back. When you've turned back again. Right? We just saw that in verse 32. And not only is he going to turn back, he's going to be used. His impending failure doesn't nullify the work of God and the grace of God in his life. That's the beauty of the gospel. Just as we can't earn our salvation through our works and our good deeds, we don't all of a sudden just lose it when we slip up and we fail and we sin. The grace that saves us is the grace that sustains us through all the ups and downs of our walk. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. It's not a a license to sin. I can't emphasize that enough. But it gives us a confidence that our eternal hope isn't rooted or dependent on us at all. It's all in Christ. And that's what Jesus is praying for Peter. He wouldn't lose his faith. And notice Jesus doesn't tell Peter that you're going to, before the rooster crows, your faith in me will fail. It will vanish. No, he just says three times that you will deny knowing me. They, though they may not seem like the same thing, they are, or they may not seem different, they are different. Peter will deny outwardly that he knows who Jesus is out of fear of man and the consequences that are, uh, he's afraid would actually happen, possibly imprisonment and death. But, Inside, we know his heart still treasures and values Jesus. We deny knowing Jesus every time we sin. That doesn't mean we've lost our faith and our trust or our love for Christ any less. And when we sin, we should be grieved if we are in Christ. As the Spirit convicts us in those moments. That's the evidence of the faith that still remains is that conviction of sin. That deep remorse for denying knowing Christ and ignoring him and doing what we want in our way, in our flesh. And we're going to see that Peter, when he does hear the rooster crow, he weeps bitterly. He's broken by it. Commentator uh, David Garland, I thought this was just interesting. He says, The rooster's crow matches Peter's cocky boastfulness. As the strutting, crowing king of the chicken coop, the rooster is a proverbial example of foolish pride. Its sound will snap Peter awake to recognize the scope of his failure, but also will remind him of Jesus' assurance. I've never thought of comparing Peter to a rooster, and that's not the point, I think, of what Jesus is saying, but that is just interesting to think about. If you've seen, like, roosters, they, that's Peter. The, the guy's a rooster. But that sound will remind him both of what Jesus said, but also the assurance that he has, and I think that's just a, a wonderful truth that he, he brings out. Jesus knows Peter's not going to be able to stand in his own strength. This The zeal that he has is not going to last. But it's not until this denial actually happens to Peter that Peter will realize it. And we're no different. It's not until we slip and fall on the floor that we realize, I should have read the wet floor sign. Like, what, what was I thinking? But maybe an encouragement to us this morning that God 
willingly uses sinners like Peter, like you, like I, when he knows we're going to fail, when he knows we're not perfect, that we will slip up, that he can use us for his glory, for his purposes, for the sake of the gospel. May it also be a warning for us to be on guard against ourselves. We can't trust the inner voice and the emotions we feel inside all the time. We need to lean fully on Christ. To lean on him, to pray for him for strength, for boldness, that our faith may not fail. And after dropping that bomb on Peter... Jesus then turns his attention back to the entire group as we look at verses 35 through 38. And he said to them, When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, Nothing. He said to them, But now let the one who has a money bag take it, And likewise a knapsack. Let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. Jesus is reminding them of a passage that we saw in Luke chapter 9. As he sends them the twelve out with nothing. Entirely leaning on God's provision as they go out uh, to spread the gospel, to heal. uh, They're going out and they're just needing to find people who will give them housing provide them food, provide everything that they need, relying 100% on God's provision. But now Jesus is telling them, you, you, know, you, you, may have, you didn't lack anything then, but a tide is turning. Things are going in a direction where they're not necessarily going to be quite as hospitable. There will be far more people who aren't willing to care for followers of Christ than when you went out before. So you're not going to find the same treatment. Why? What's changing? For I tell you that the scripture must be fulfilled in me, and he was numbered with his transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. Now we'll talk about exactly what Jesus is, is saying here in the next point. But what he's saying is, he's pointing them to Isaiah 53, the suffering servant being put to death, being numbered with the transgressors, being numbered with the rebels, that Jesus is going to be crucified. That he's going to be sought after. That he's going to be killed. There's going to be hostility toward him. And they need to be prepared because that same hostility will await them. They need to be prepared for that. The days of rolling into town and and having people really happy to see Jesus and his crew come in. That's done. The warm receptions are over. Open doors and seats at people's tables are going to be few and far between. So he's telling them, you were able to go out with nothing before. Now you need to be prepared and equipped for what's to come. Because it's not going to be easy. I'm still going to provide for you. God never stops providing for them. But they need to be prepared for what's to come. And the question is, what exactly was Jesus getting at when he said, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, likewise a knapsack. Let the one who has no sword sell his cloak to buy one. Is he like giving them like a checklist of, here's the things you're going to need to have every day from now on. Was it a call to arms? Like make sure you have a sword because now you're going to have to fight. The disciples seem to think so because their response after that, after Jesus tells them that he's going to be killed for them, they kind of miss that whole reference. And their response is, look, Lord, here are two swords. Kind of missing what's been said. They're just like excited because they're like, you said swords, here's two of them. And Jesus, his response to them indicates that they're not quite getting it. And what he says is, it is enough. Now, you could just read this and as we're reading through and just think, okay, Jesus says this. The disciples say, we got two swords. Jesus says, it is enough. You could think he's just saying, two swords will do you just fine. I'm sure you'll take out 
everyone against you with those two swords. It's going to be good. Jesus can do anything, right? I mean, he fed over 5,000 people with a couple loaves of bread and some fish. So, but what most commentators have said, the overwhelming majority, is that Jesus, what he's saying when he says it is enough, as he's recognizing, you guys aren't getting what I'm saying. That's enough of this. We're done. We're done here. As though he just sees they're missing the point. They got to move on. Like, I, 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 I just told you that I was going to fill, fulfill one of the most major prophecies in all the Old Testament. And you're like, sword? Like, that. <laughs> enough. It's enough. It is enough. I've, I've told you enough. You'll, you'll get it eventually. Because the idea of Jesus giving them a, a literal list of things to pack just doesn't make sense. He's really, he's speaking metaphorically, just trying to paint a picture that life is going to get tougher. He's not preparing them to go out for physical battle. That the, the, that the trials they face are going to have to be sword fights. And, and we see this. We see this literally in the same chapter that Peter is going to have a sword. He's going to cut someone's ear off. And Jesus is going to tell him, stop. That's not what we're doing. And he even heals the man's ear. I know I'm just spoiling chapter 22 for you guys today. But we have had it for thousands of years. So in my defense, it's okay. But we, we see that. Um, in that, that portion, that, that Peter's like, we're, we're not going to battle with swords. And then we have literally the entire book of Acts, where we don't see the apostles gearing up for war, going from city to city, just killing everyone who's against them. We actually see the opposite. As the book progressive more and more progresses, more and more of them are getting killed for just standing and preaching the gospel, peacefully pointing people to Christ. So Jesus wasn't calling them to bear swords and to use the sword and to fight for him in that way. He's trying to communicate, you're going into a hostile world instead of a hospitable world. Be ready for it. Be equipped with an unwavering faith, with a knowledge of the scripture, standing firm on the foundation that's been laid. And the same still goes for us, right? As we're seeking to live on mission, to declare and demonstrate the gospel. We live in an anti-gospel culture. Things that are evil are seen as good and applauded. And things that are good are seen as, as being evil and bigoted. We need to stand firm in the gospel. Equipped with the sword of truth. The scriptures. And that's what Jesus wants them to be ready to do. Just, you know, if I was to bring it back to what he's praying for Peter, that their faith wouldn't fail, that they would stand up, that they would see the trial that's in front of them and still proclaim Christ. And I want to just, in the last few minutes in this last point, go back to verse 37. Because this is a big a big verse here as we look at providing atonement. Jesus, he tells them this, and it's even when we are reading through it, it's so easy to get lost in the sauce and miss this. Jesus says, For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me, and he has numbered with the trans and he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. Jesus is telling his disciples in this moment that what Isaiah prophesied about the suffering servant was going to be fulfilled in him. I think this is the only time Jesus explicitly tells them that what Isaiah said is me. I am that person. He doesn't beat around the bush. He's saying very specifically, what's there, that's me. You're talking to the one who's going to be numbered with the transgressors. And somehow in all that's happening and all that's going on around them, and I, we can relate because we can be so distracted. They just overlook what Jesus is saying. And what Jesus is telling them is so important because its fulfillment is only hours away. 
Now, if you were to turn to Isaiah chapter 53, uh, which might be helpful, we're going to really just be looking at verse 12 and not even all of verse 12. There's a lot there, but Isaiah 53, 12. This is what Jesus is quoting. And Jesus is only quoting literally one little line of that. He was numbered with the transgressors. But when he says that one line of that one verse in that chapter, there's an entire context of things that come with it. And when Jesus says this, he's implying not only is he just someone who's going to be numbered with the transgressors, but he's that servant in that passage. So if you look through chapter 53, he's the one who's going to bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. Jesus is the one who's going to be smitten by God and afflicted. He's the one who will be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Upon him is going to be the chastisement that brings peace. It's going to be by his wound that we are healed. That the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He is the lamb led to slaughter. He, the one whom the Lord, it's the will of the Lord to crush. That his soul would make an offering for guilt. That he shall pour out his soul to death. When Jesus says this one line, all of that's coming with it. This is the passage about that Messiah who's going to come to give his life as the substitute for sinners. Jesus would be numbered with the transgressors. Who are the transgressors? Every sinful rebel who has sinned against God. Though Jesus did nothing wrong, he would be numbered among those who have sinned. Absorbing the punishment for all the sins of mankind. Right? 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is pointing his disciples to his atoning work. And as Isaiah 53.12 continues, he says, He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Those he dies for, he pleads for. That's who he stands in the gap for. So Christ, our perfect Savior, identifies with mankind by being numbered among the transgressors. And we actually see that visually as Christ is hung on a cross between two criminals. He identifies with us in our sin, and his, but his death makes atonement for sin because he was spotless without blemish. So though he dies a criminal's death, he himself, not a criminal, not a transgressor. But his death satisfies the debt that mankind owes because of sin. He hangs in our place to bear our sin. And he stands before the Father interceding on our behalf. That's an amazing thing to think about. Those whose sin his blood pays for, he also continues to intercede for. That's a tremendous, I hope that's a tremendous comfort and hope. That's the hope that the disciples needed as they're going to enter a tough world. And that's the hope that we need. Do you know that hope? Have you trusted Christ? The atonement that Jesus made what brings us to the table this morning because that's what we remember as we began our time in the upper room it started with the lord's supper with them around the table to celebrate the passover together to remember god's provision for them back in exodus and as he sat with them around the table celebrating the passover meal he broke bread and said to them this is my body which was given for you do this in remembrance of me Likewise, he took the cup and he said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. He's calling them to remember something that hasn't happened yet in their context. But this morning, we're remembering how the spotless Savior was numbered with the transgressors so that those of us who believe in him are counted righteous. The righteous one paying the debt numbered with the unrighteous so that we could be righteous. We're remembering how 
even after his death, he is alive, he is reigning, and he's interceding for us. This table helps us to remember this morning that we're no longer, we're not making sacrifices through the blood of animals, but we have the perfect substitutionary sacrifice in Christ, and it's his blood that cleanses us from all of our sin and unrighteousness. See, these tables that we have, they're not King's Chapel tables. But these elements are for all who have put their faith and their trust in Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, when we do take communion, we just ask that you refrain from coming to the table. But it's our our sincere hope, my sincere hope and prayer that that would change this morning. That you would see his goodness and his grace and his love for you and that you would confess want to confess your sin, repent, and receive his salvation this morning. And if that is the case, then when you do that, come, take, eat, drink, celebrate what Christ has done for you. The band can make their way up, and they're going to play in a few moments. And when they do, let us take time to think about and just meditate on what Jesus shared this morning to his disciples through his word. Think through where, where do we fall short? Because we know we do. Where are we wrapped up in looking at ourselves inside and our own emotion and trying to follow in our own strength instead of looking to him? In what ways do we just miss entirely what Jesus is saying And just to do what we think is best. Just like Peter, just like the disciples, for us, there's nothing that surprises Jesus. But he invites us to confess our sin, to repent of that sin, and to walk in the grace and the hope and the forgiveness of the gospel. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you for what you have given us through your servant Luke as he documented these things and we have these words of Jesus to his disciples. And we just pray that the the hope that he was giving them would be a hope to us, that we know Christ is our great high priest interceding on our behalf, pleading for us before the Father, that we are secure in our salvation in him because it was nothing to do of ourselves but all because of what Jesus paid and did on the cross. We ask that you would help us to to look inside to see our own sinfulness, our own wickedness before your holy perfection that you would bring us to a place of brokenness like Peter that we would confess that to you. We would repent and we would walk in the love and the grace that you've shown us in your redemption through Christ this morning. We thank you that you're the one holding us, the one sustaining us. And we just ask that you would strengthen our faith this morning. They would see the beauty of Christ and the security we have in him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.